Energy 808, the cutting edge. Wow, do we have a show today. We have my co-host, Eric Gleason, joining me again. And we have a stellar, stellar guest in the personage of Catherine Blunt from the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so very much, Eric, for joining me again. And thank you, especially Catherine, for being available today to have, I'm sure it's going to be a really juicy conversation amongst the three of us. So mahalo nui to both of you. Happy to be here. So let's take the uh, immediate dive. I always like to to ask uh, our guests kind of what, what brought them to where they are now. And in your particular case, what brought you down the path to become an energy beat reporter at the uh, Wall Street Journal? Well, before joining the Wall Street Journal, it was about five years ago, I worked for the Houston Chronicle. I did a little bit of energy coverage, uh, but really there was the opportunity to cover power and utilities at the Journal, and I recognized that it was going to be a, um, an important space and only become more so, um, just given the energy transition and, and things along those lines. Um, I started in my role on November 5th, 2018, and three days later, one of pg and power lines ignited the campfire in Northern California that destroyed the town of Paradise. And within a matter of weeks, it became very clear that pg and &E was going to be not only the biggest utility story in the nation, but really one of the biggest stories of the entire year. Um, and I spent a great deal of time focused on that. And uh, it was really, um, I had to learn extremely quickly, and it was quite a fascinating lens through which to learn about the utility space. Uh, I've been doing it ever since. And fascinating uh, to the point where you wrote a whole book about it that came out <laughs> last year that Eric and I have uh, have both read California Burning. So it's it's great uh, that you t you were dedicated and interested in, enough, obviously, in the subject to to actually do a whole book on it. And uh, boy, anybody wants to know anything about pg and &E, I mean, you wrote the Bible really from beginning to to the current day. So kudos for your 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 fantastic book on uh, on pg and &E. So Eric, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, th thank you, Catherine, for for being here. Um, you know, you did you you wrote the book on utility caused wildfires, um, which was you know it's a terrific, terrific, terrific book. I mean, obviously a terrible tragedy. Um, you live in California, so it'd be really interesting to get your perspective on what's changed over the last five years or so since since the PG and E caused fires and. Um, has California figured out how to manage this risk? Sure. So it's been quite an intense five years in which yeah, after the um, the 2018 fire, the campfire, uh, combined with a series of fires that ignited in 2017, pg and &E estimated it at $30 billion in liability costs. It sought bankruptcy protection for the second time this century. And um, that had major consequences for wildfire victims, the state of California itself. Um, really, really challenging few years there. And since the company has emerged, I will say if there's anything positive to come out of that, it's that the company has never been more aware of the risks that it faces. And it's under new leadership um, that is very dedicated to trying to kind of turn the ship permanently with a, you know, a suite of risk reduction measures meant to um, put this company on a trajectory in which it won't have to seek bankruptcy protection again. Um, that being said, the challenge is really great. There's millions of dead trees as a result of years of severe drought. Um, you know, climate change threatens to make that worse with every passing year. Uh, there might be a bit of a reprieve this year just because the winter was so wet, but uh, we've seen in the past uh, drought can sneak up and it can sneak up very quickly. And so um, it's, we're, we're at a period in which the consequence of infrastructure failure has never been higher. Um, it might have been 20 years ago that a power line could fail and start a fire that was relatively easily contained. Right now, the conditions are such, especially on a windy day, that that fire has the potential to blaze out of control. And so the question really becomes, that, I mean, from a wildfire perspective, how do you prevent power lines from sparking? But I mean, I guess from the state's perspective as well, how do you address in some of the potential other causes as well? I mean, this is, this is not just a utility issue, though. Utility lines have been implicated in some of the worst fires we've seen of late. Mm -hmm. And then the largest fires, I think. Some of them, you know, yes. have that utility cause. Many of them. Yes. Um, do you, so it sounds like, I mean, that did not fill me with great, um, a great sense of comfort that 
um, the risk has been significantly reduced. I mean, do, do you think has has how much progress has really been made? Well, to be fair, I think that there has been um, quite a bit of progress made by each of California's large utilities. The Southern California utilities have had a bit of a head start on fire mitigation. The California Public Utilities Commission required these companies to do more to address fire risk earlier because it was understood that um, fire, well, it was it was thought that fire risk was greatest in Southern California because that's historically been true. Um, it's really not true anymore. It, it, the risk profile of Northern California has changed very quickly, again, as a result of drought and tree mortality. PG&E has, has made quite a bit of progress in figuring out at least interim ways to reduce risk. Um, there's, of course, the sort of the typical tools that a utility uses by you know, trimming trees, doing thorough inspections, frequent inspections, proper maintenance to make um, the likelihood of power line failure less. Um, but to supplement that, it's been doing two things. It's tweaked the settings on its power line so that if uh, you know, a branch or an animal or any other object comes into contact with the line wire, it shuts off within a tenth of a second. Um, and then the other tool is that it's, uh, uh, all the California utilities do this, they proactively shut um, shut off power to the parts of the system in risky conditions so that if, again, if there's the prospect of anything coming in contact with those wires, um, the lines are de-energized and it significantly reduces fire risk in those particular areas. But again, I mean that that's a that th these are both safety measures that come at the expense of reliability. So the company is trying to figure out how to um, better balance that going forward with more permanent risk reductions uh, measures, such as putting the wires underground. One of the things that really struck me is uh, after PG&E declared bankruptcy for what the second time in twenty some odd years, there were some very real, credible voices and forces to break up the company. Uh, from the mayor of the mayors of, I believe, it was San Jose, San Francisco, and other entities that were really uh, put a serious effort into trying to break the company up, and understandably, PG&E fought that and they effectively prevailed. Correct. So I'm wondering why why they all failed. I mean, uh, the kind of shows a little bit my head as far as I'm, I'm more in favor of uh, decentralized power and having kind of more local control if possible, as opposed to a large IOU that has such a large service territory. Uh, why were all those efforts to try to break up the company in the bankruptcy process, uh, ultimately they failed? Well, I think that there's, there's kind of two conversations to be had about ownership structure. There's kind of a philosophical conversation about what could potentially be the best model. And then there's a practical conversation about the fact that I think at this point, changing a me meaningful change to the ownership structure of an investor-owned utility is, is really difficult, especially the one the size of pg and &E. I think that, you know, resting control from shareholders would be a really long, expensive, and litigious process that a lot of stakeholders ultimately wouldn't want to necessarily go through. The options that were proposed as PG&E was going through its second bankruptcy, there was a couple of ideas kicking around. Um, you saw, you know, a, a city like San Francisco want to break off and form its own municipal utility, which is an interesting idea, but there's a couple of issues associated with that. His, San Francisco is not at great risk of fire. It's, it's, you know, as a, as a city itself, it faces that, that risk is very low. It's really the surrounding areas that are most prone to wildfire risk. And if you think about where utility, excuse me, PG&E has been investing the most money over the years, it's been ensuring that San Francisco's power is quite reliable or the, really the entire Bay Area, because that's, um, the, you know, the, the biggest of the population base that it serves. So it would be more of a symbolic split if, if San Francisco were to hive off and PG&E opposed that because it would set a precedent in which other, um, you know, cities and towns um, could break off and then you begin to see the revenue base change, right? I mean, the, the often utilities kind of exist to serve cities or at least that's where they reap most of their, their revenue and that allows uh, the company to fund or at least theoretically, you know, fund investments in the rest of the system in rural areas. It just, it creates kind of a challenging business model if you see those population centers break off. The second idea was to create a um, customer-owned cooperative in which PG&E would no longer be owned by shareholders. It would be owned by its customers. It would no longer have a profit motive. Um, 
And that idea, I think it was certainly interesting. It would, it would, PG&E by far would be the largest cooperative in the entire country if that were to happen. But, you know, it solves some problems such as, again, you know, the, um, the challenge of, of balancing the interests of customers and shareholders that uh, the need to strike that balance is eliminated in the co-op model. But there's still some issues with, you know, who is responsible for fire damages if power line fires ignite, which is almost inevitable. Um, wasn't a perfect solution either. And uh, of course, that would require getting the agreement of PG&E shareholders to sign off on that. And that was uh, really kind of a, um, a distant prospect at the time of the bankruptcy. Great. Eric, you know, one of the, one of the, um, I, I'd like to come back to this, this whole topic of, of the PG&E bankruptcy. And one of the things that, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't totally clear on it and it's me as a reader, right? Cause your, your book was great, but is, did, did they have to file when they filed it? It, it, it took the market by surprise. I remember the stock price went down. Is that, is that something they, they needed to do? Were there reasons, were there advantages in doing it? What, what is your take on that? Yeah, there was certainly a number of people, especially within the investor community, who believed that they didn't have to. And they were a solvent debtor. Um, they they uh, thought that, that that move was unnecessary. I do think it allowed them to consolidate a lot of the lawsuits that were pending and, and deal with it in a way that would have been um, swifter and probably more beneficial to the company overall in the long run. And so, I mean, I, th I can understand why uh, there were compelling reasons from the corporate standpoint as to why it would engage in that. It was disappointing to so a, a number of people, and it certainly had significant consequences, some of which I think the company didn't foresee in terms of the uh, the toll that it would take on its financial health, given the involvement of some of the uh, the financial interests that ultimately shaped the outcome of the case. Um, so, so let's let's explore that a little bit more because that that was really another dimension that I found fascinating. Is you know uh, my 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 basic summary would be it sounded like it was a food fight. I mean, you had you had creditors, you had different sorts of creditors, you had shareholders, you had you know um, victims. Um, how you had you had you had government agencies, you know, they were trying to get compensated for their costs. Is that is that a fair summary that it's kind of a food fight Absolutely. and everybody's everybody's scrambling for their piece of the pie? Not only a food fight, but a really nasty one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of competing interests here, a lot of moneyed interests. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then management puts, put in the end, put forward a plan that I think was approved by the bankruptcy court. Um, you know, I think maybe there were a couple of iterations of that, but you know, in that, do you have, and, and I'm not, uh, there's obviously a different management team to now in any case, but, but I'm curious if you have a view, you know, where, where were the victims in all of this? Were, you know, how, how much, how, how does management balance doing right by the victims versus doing right by their shareholders versus doing right by their creditors? Because they seem to have some discretion in this in this process. They certainly have some discretion in the process, but I mean the so again some of the financial interests that ha held a lot of sway in the way the agreements were ultimately reached. Um, uh, also, all, I mean, also had a, a again. I mean. The, there was there was a lot of influential voices at the table. Let me put it that way, and so how it happened was um, between um, a series of fires in 2017 and the 2018 campfire, the company estimates it owes 30 billion, seeks bankruptcy protection, has to reach settlements with three major classes of claimants, three main classes. Um, the first was simple; it was governmental agencies that had incurred fire suppression costs and other things. Um, that that group was the first to reach a settlement for a billion dollars in cash. The second class gets a little bit more complicated. Um, where I, it should be said, just so the listeners understand, in California, if a, um, if a power line ignites a wildfire, the utility is responsible for the damages that result regardless of how the line is maintained. It's a strict liability con construct. So uh, there's no need for proof of negligence in order to um, for uh, those whose properties were destroyed to be able to seek compensation. Because of that, insurance companies that paid claims to homeowners had a right to seek reimbursement of those payments uh, from PG&E. 
So this the second class of claimants was ostensibly insurance companies that had again, you know, um, paid claims. But instead of waiting for a settlement, a lot of these companies had sold their claims on the secondary market to hedge funds, um, some for as little as fifty cents on the dollar. And those hedge funds, one in particular, Baupost Group, had a great deal of influence in the way that settlement was negotiated. That settlement um, came in at eleven billion dollars all cash. So by the time the company uh, was negotiating its settlement with individual fire victims. The company was out $11 billion in cash and didn't have enough left to fully compensate the value of their claims. So how it shook out was this third settlement was um, valued at $13.5 billion. The company agreed to pay it half with cash, half with shares in the company that would be administered through a trust. So the fire victims would hold these shares indirectly through this trust that would slowly liquidate them um, in order to compensate them for their losses. And, you know, um, it was very controversial, obviously. I mean, on principle, a lot of victims don't want to hold shares in PG&E indirectly. Uh, it meant that the val overall value of their compensation depended on the company's uh, stock performance post-bankruptcy. And, you know, there was uh, a lot of criticism as well that, I mean, the hedge funds and the insurance companies are in the business of being able to capitalize on risk, and yet they negotiated settlements that were completely uh, devoid of it, instead, like leaving that risk to the fire victims to shoulder. And so did management have a role in this? Of course. But I mean, so did the other, um, I mean, the financial interests that were able to really turn the screws and and get what they wanted out of the bankruptcy process. Uh, a lot of them were quite shrewd in this way and, and sophisticated at navigating some of these, you know, complex financial settlements and, and negotiations. And so I guess it's fair to say that the victims in general are not at the front of the line in a bankruptcy process, right? They're, they're, uh, am I right that there are any judgments or what have you are unsecured creditors? Yeah, I, I mean, um, I mean, this is kind of a, an odd case since, I mean, we're talking about civil litigation in this, not civil litigation, but civil claims, right? I guess it is litigation, but uh, it's, all of these negotiations were kind of taking place simultaneously. Uh, there was, even within the groups representing the victims, there was disagreement as to how to best move forward. And some of the disagreements that were happening as part of these conversations, to some extent, allowed for the other groups to reach their resolutions more quickly. Um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of things happening all at once. And I, I don't think this is, should all be painted as, you know, any like nefarious or behavior by any one party or anything like that. It's just, it, it ended up getting pretty complicated. Uh, a quick follow-up on that, Catherine, then let's move across the Pacific to uh, Hawaii. Uh, so the day before pg e filed for bankruptcy protection, do you happen to know where their credit rating was amongst the big three? Were, were they, any uh, of the big three, did they put them in the C category, which is kind of the, the dark, deep, dark zone? Do you I don't remember when they were first downgraded. Um, I would imagine they probably were after the 2017 fires, but I, I would have to double check that. Um, it, it would be likely uh, at that point because there was like a lot of indications that there was uh, credit risk at that point. Well, moving across the ocean to uh, Maui and Hawaiian Electric and the tragedy of April 8th, uh, I've been reading your reporting, as many others have over the past weeks, and uh, I wanted to ask you kind of, uh, you, you of course have all this background from fires in California, and you wrote on what happened and what is happening in Hawaii, Maui in particular. What, it, what it kind of stands out in particular to you as far as your reporting with your background of uh, big fires on the mainland and what happened and what's continuing to happen with uh, Maui and Hawaiian Electric? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that stand out in my mind. And I'll, I'll say off the top, of course, we don't know officially what caused the fire. Um, that's, uh, you know, ATF is investigating. We will wait to see what goes on there. Um, the comp Hawaiian Electric has uh, publicly denied that it, um, it doesn't believe that its power lines ignited the fire that ultimately destroyed Lahaina. And so, well, so I'll say that off the top. That being said, what we do know is that uh, at least uh, I, um, with some colleagues, took a deep dive into some of the company's regulatory filings to try to figure out 
how it's been thinking about wildfire risk and what it's been spending money on over the last few years. And what we were able to determine is that in 2019, the company announced that it had been observing the situation in California with PG&E and believed it needed to do more to address wildfire risk and other climate-driven risk as well. But um, you know, in particular, it highlighted a number of steps that it wanted to take to reduce the risk of its lines igniting wildfires. Um, it didn't submit an official filing to the Public Utilities Commission seeking permission to recoup that spending through customers until 2022. Now, the, the company says, well, it hired a consultant and the consultant took a long time to make recommendations. And then they took the recommendations and took a long time to make a plan. It's all pretty typical in the world of utilities. But it appears, based on what we know, that you know the risk on the islands, it was changing very quickly, um, as it is throughout the rest of the West. We're seeing fire risk um, increase precipitously as a result of drought, dry vegetation, high winds. Um, uh, also, just uh, more people living in close proximity to areas at risk of burning, making the consequence of infrastructure failure higher. And so um, in 2022, it submits a, a large filing seeking to spend you know, millions of dollars addressing wildfire risk, other risks driven by climate change, and that proceeding is still pending before the commission. Again, I mean, none of this is uncommon on typical utility timelines, but it appears that um, you know, the risks Hawaii Electric and other companies are facing might be changing more quickly than they're able to move. Uh, we certainly saw that with with PG&E, and there's always criticism in hindsight that, you know, for example, PG&E could have moved faster, Hawaii Electric could have moved faster. There are constraints in how quickly these companies can move. That being said, the, the, the signs of the risks have been there. I mean, I'm sure for Hawaiian Electric, well before 2019. For PG&E, well before 2017 or even 2015 when it had its first major fire. And, um, you know, I think in both cases, both the companies and their, regu their respective regulatory bodies kind of failed to realize how quickly things were changing and, and um, kind of... Uh, failed to initiate action at a point in which some of this could have been averted. Um, I'd like to ask you um, a little bit more about that. So, you know, what Mark Twain said, history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes, or at least allegedly he said that. Why is it that multiple utilities and multiple communities seem to be repeating very similar and preventable catastrophes, do you think? Well, I think it's a sad truth that in this industry, as well as others, it often takes a disaster for I, it takes a disaster for a company to realize the extent of the problems that it faces. It's not just true of utilities; it's true of other uh, other like it's true of other industries as well. Um, but I also think that you know, in particular, I mean, the utility industry is particularly slow moving for one, just because of the regulatory process, which under normal circumstances is, you know, meant to protect customers, um, protect due process. I mean, things that are ostensibly good, but when things are changing in ways that they haven't historically, kind of that process gets called into question, right? Um, I was talking to Michael War at Stanford the other day about all of this, and he said something that stuck with me, just in terms of a metaphor, you know, we we're talking about how long it takes for utilities to get regulatory approval to recoup spending on things, um, you know, just sort of the typical process. He's like, yeah, this was this was all well and good 20 years ago. You know, we're talking specifically about utilities in the West. He's like, it was all well and good when the utility had no competition, right? That's the whole idea. The, 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 it's a um, regulated monopoly and you're subject to the regulatory process as a result. It's like, fire is now the competition. Fire can come in and take out your business in an instant. And... I think that that's an interesting way to think about it, um, and it, you could you could say that of other you know operational risks and climate risks as well for other utilities um, throughout. And the the other thing too that's kind of part and parcel of this whole conversation about a changing climate um, or just different operational risks as the system ages or however you want to think about it is that the utility industry is pretty backward looking. It typically uses historical, you know, patterns and experiences to try to prepare for what's about to happen next. And that relationship seems to be breaking down. So I think a lot of utilities have kind of tripped in the last number of years as they've, as they've um, had to confront this. 
and you know have been caught flat-footed when something really went awry uh, of their you know typical predictions. If you look at, I mean, considering your writing, you were unmistakably clear that there was equipment dating back many decades in the PG&E infrastructure, right, that clearly failed and was was it should have been obvious or noted and placed at some point, and that that constituted uh, negligence on the part of the company, which led to bankruptcy and, uh, and that whole process. And I'm wondering if you look at, or based on what you reported or know so far or uncovered so far, you look at the utility infrastructure on Maui, our uh, utility infrastructure uh, across Hawaiian Electric territories. Do you have any sense yet as far as just how aged and subpar uh, the Maui Electric infrastructure is and to what extent Hawaiian Electric was aware of this equipment being edgy or beyond edgy? Sure. So just to, to your point about pg e that's really quite an extreme case. Um, the issue with the campfire in 2018 occurred when a very small hook on a tall remote transmission tower in the Sierra foothills broke almost exactly in half, dropped a live wire that swung against the metal tower um, and resulted in you know, sparks falling on bone dry brush. Um, that hook in, that was almost exactly 100 years old. It had been installed around like 1915. It was original infrastructure. And it had been wearing down little by little for 100 years. And the wear had been visible for decades. And yet the company's inspection practices weren't sufficient to catch it. With Hawaiian Electric, um, in a number of different filings, they've alluded to the fact that um, the poles supporting their distribution wires are, are pretty old and, and wouldn't, you know, not up to the standard of, say, those in Florida, which have been hardened to withstand hurricanes and other strong storms. Um, that's an example of something I think the company did know. Uh, exactly what the issue was with the power line that, that failed. They acknowledged that there was a uh, down power line that started a fire. They just don't think it was the one that destroyed the, the town. We will see. Um, this, I, don't, I don't have any direct knowledge into the specific conditions of like that failure. But certainly the company in, in various filings has acknowledged like, yeah, there's stuff that's not up to snuff, A. And there's also more that we could do to, put, um, you know, to make the system stronger, generally safer as well. And I guess uh, the last time I, I looked, I believe there are 14 lawsuits that have been filed against the company, Hawaiian Electric, including, of course, the, the one from County of Maui. So, I mean, assuming that one or more of these cases, uh, litigation goes to actual before judge and jury. You know, these, these will be questions which will be uh, uh, right in the forefront as far as uh, the, the condition of the equipment. You can yeah. trust that, the, the, yeah, the trial attorneys will turn over every rock. <laughs> yes. Eric? Catherine, um, based on everything you know, do you have any advice for the people of Hawaii? Um, you know, one thing that, What I hope, um, California burning, the book seems to have had um, a good deal of impact within uh, industry and folks who are close to you know utility companies or work for them. Uh, but it also seems to resonate quite a bit with, with people outside the industry and just appreciating the fact that it's helped them understand a bit more about how this really complex industry works. And you know whether you read the book or not, I think that it's, it's a really important time to kind of learn a little bit more about this because the nice thing about the regulatory process is it's, you can participate in it. You know, you can, you, I mean, it's not, certainly not the most fun nor the most convenient and I wouldn't pretend otherwise, but it does allow for people to weigh in on utility decision-making and spending and um, priorities and, you know, the ability to, I mean, everything from your role as a consumer and having rooftop solar and, and backup storage if that's what you want or you know being able to really oversee the way that the utility is maintaining the centralized system um there are ways to get involved and i think that if this is you know of concern and i think it should be going forward i mean more participation can only be good i have uh, made it's a great place to kind of uh, wind things up uh, i want to read a quote from your page 292 Catherine, which i think uh is a question you posed that I'd uh, like to have you take a 
take a shot at answering it, and I'll, I'll read the quote here. The grid had been built to withstand patterns of the past, and those patterns were changing fast at a time when electricity had never been more critical. Every utility would soon face the same question. How should its system change to account for future risk? How should the system ch change to account for future risk? So obviously a very broad and wide, deep question that you pose. Uh, you want to take a, a crack at answering it? Sure. Well, I think some of the smartest utilities are investing a substantial amount of money to try to understand what climate risk means for them, um, what new sorts of str um, stresses on the system may appear as a result of, you know, longer periods of heat, longer periods of drought, um, stronger storms, w whatever it may be. Um, and I think that some of it involves preparing the system or upgrading it to meet new standards to be able to withstand those stresses. But I think necessarily as well, part of it involves probably taking, um, changing the way the system is configured. In some cases, you know, think you think about, we're talking about wildfire, you think about some of the most remote areas in California and the foothills, maybe it doesn't make sense anymore to be running power lines over many miles to serve these communities. They, we need some you know, microgrids or islands that can operate independently of the grid itself. Um, so different ways to supply power and minimize you know, the risk that comes from having thousands of miles of wire crisscrossing the forests. That's just an example from the West. Um, I, mean, I mean, perhaps it's the same for some strong prone areas. It's, uh, I get it. Is does the system need to look exactly the same as it has for the last hundred years? And I think probably uniformly across the country, the answer is no. Um, but also, I think for as long as we inhabit this earth, we're going to need some form of a centralized system. And in, in which case, how do you prepare it then uh, for a future that's not going to look the same um, as it did over the last uh, hundred years for the time at which this this grid has existed? Yeah, yeah, very well put. I'll let uh, you wrap things up, Eric. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. Um, it's been it's been uh, very instructive. We, um, you know, your expertise and your time, and um, you know, we look forward to your next book. Well, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it was uh, it was great to have you on, Catherine, and uh, again, Mahalo Nui for joining us today, and uh, you, Eric Gleason, joining us from. Uh, about as far away uh, from Hawaii as one can be and still in the same country and uh, the magic of technology. 5,000. 5,000. Yeah. 5,000 long miles. Wish I was there with you. Uh -huh. I know you will be before too long. So again, thank you very much, Catherine Bunt, Eric Gleason. Till the next time, I hope. I believe.